You're listening to LibraryCast, your library podcast with me, Jeremy Thompson-Smith, Somerset Library's Outreach Officer for the Mendips. On this week's podcast, we welcome the Wells Fountain Poets Group. Tell us a little bit about who are the Wells Fountain Poets? Uh, We're a random group of poets who live within a few miles of Wells. And I think the group started in 2002, but it's a long time ago now. It's around about that. And it was started by Jane Williams, who uh, was a retired teacher, is a retired teacher from Bristol, who moved to Wells. And we used to meet monthly in her flat. And very soon the group became too big for the flat. So we, we sort of went public. We've met in various places, most recently, Before the lockdown, we met in the Globe in Priest Row. Uh, We have, nowadays we have a reading from a featured poet and an open mic for the second half, and that seems to work very well. Uh, There are no qualifications for joining. You don't have to be a poet. You don't have to be published. Some people just come to listen, and after a while, they start writing, which is wonderful. And our, our sort of manifesto is we listen in a spirit of respect to every poem, whether it comes from a published poet or a complete beginner, and every reader gets a chance to read two poems normally, unless they're terribly long. We're not meeting at the moment, but we look forward to meeting again. The poem I'd like to read is actually by Jane Williams, our founder, um, and it's called Mend It Burial. On the bright skyline lie the Bronze Age dead, sinew and bone fired to red dust, soft sifted into mendic earth. In blossoming spring weather, we walked the deep valley, thick with wild daffodils, up the steep hillside to rough downland heather, you and I racing each other to the tumuli, laughing and out of breath, talking inconsequentially of death, knowing we were immortal. The broken portal of the tomb is scoured by time, wind sculpted limestone, fallen ramparts, dark fissures into an underworld. I stretch my hand to touch this cold rock, wishing to lock the past. But time is hourglass sand, the sharp air smells of autumn, winter is on the wind. Insects gorge on bloated blackberries, crab apples fall and bruise. Now the evening sun halos the ancient barrow. I turn my back, walk home alone, leaving my past behind. Thank you. That was wonderful. What inspires your poetry, Rachel? Well, I, I have different um inspirations and it it was just so lovely to hear that poem of Jane's which I hadn't heard before and we didn't know what each other was going to read and interestingly the Mendip Masters become very significant in my life I I look out towards the 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 Mendip Hills from Glastonbury and the and the mast is on the skyline and it's become my sort of meditational yoga focus at night when I do a little stretching practice and my prayers so <laughs> I love that um, yeah I, I, I think yeah nature is is a very deep part of me it's my spiritual connection really and um, like the poem that Amma read the, the one I've got to offer is also based in this location but on a very different part of our landscape I realised I wanted to go to one of my favourite walks on Shapwick Heath on the levels along the Sweet Track. And the day I went, it was just incredibly magical with light and um, the willow seeds were just coating everything, all the surfaces. And that's what my poem's about. Yeah, the, the other, other parts of my um, poetic interests are very much about background, relationships, childhood. I come from a migrant family, so that there's, an, there's been interest in that um, as well. Well, I'll just read this one. Today, the light, spaced with diamonds. How it dapples the green, then pools, slices through gaps, silhouetted by branch fretwork. It pirouettes 
skips over foliage, the ecstasy of new summer unleashed without us. A fledgling hops up a branch, curious to taste sallow seeds, fluffy as itself. Blown catkins carpet the still dark of peaty water, crisscrossed by leafy peepholes to endless blue, and a lake mazed with yellow lilies, breeze tips Corners, tips corners of lily pads briefly, reveals pale undersides like promises of hope scattered on leaves. In the singing of great tit, chaffinch, chet is warbler, calling new life. We too find ourselves newly fledged. Breathe in. I'm going to try a free-for-all for the whole of the Wells Fountain Poetry Group, so whoever wishes to answer, or all of you. Do you feel, with the current times where we're at home, we can look outside and occasionally walk in the countryside, more inspired to write poetry? Or has it inhibited your poetry creativity? What do you think? Well, I, I can answer that while the others are thinking. I, I, I kind of been through a writer's block for about a year. and. Um, I just, it was almost like a completely lost interest. I certainly lost my hunger. At the beginning of lockdown, I think many of us who were poets and writers just felt paralyzed. It just seemed irrelevant. It just seemed like we just couldn't. And then slowly but surely things crept in. There have been lots of poetry events on Zoom, which has worked quite well, mostly. Um, and there was a, a local poet from Froome, Liv Talk, who started something called High Flu, where she was encouraging anybody and everybody to write haikus about where they were that week and people to, um, to submit photographs of that, that they'd taken that week. And it actually, it got onto a woman's hour. It's been on BBC, you know, because hundreds of people have been responding to that as the weeks have gone by. And I've suddenly started flooding back into writing again. So I'm very happy about that. What is your current poem that you're writing that's not quite finished yet? I'm doing a little online course and um, I had a lovely conversation with my lifelong friend Carol yesterday. We, we often speak on the phone and we have long conversations and I live alone and that's something I felt really, really starved of. She, for her, it was about not being able to touch her daughter uh, and that really deep urge to hug and to hold. So um, I, I'm, I'm doing an online course and this week it's about writing prose poems, which are that sort of specific genre of poetry where you write in paragraphs. So I wrote a poem about that conversation and how it made me feel and it's called Because Carol. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and it was, for me, it was actually about that I don't miss physical touch, but for me it's about touching words touching ideas and so our telephone call was almost like touching like a brain cuddle. Amma, have you got any poetry that you're writing at the moment and how inspired are you feeling in current strange times? Well I do seem to be still writing um, despite everything and what I'm working on at the moment one of the things I'm working on is called Postcards from Lost Time and it's a kind of retrospective of my life writing about different stages of my life, places I've lived in, things that have happened, people I've known. And that's an ongoing thing. I don't know how long it'll be when it's finished, if it'll ever be finished. And it's partly because my daughter asked me to write a memoir. And uh, I started that. And then I sort of got sidetracked into this, which is um, a poem in, in three line chunks. So it's very, it's very brief. Also, I'm using the time to do a lot of going back to old poems, mm -hmm. polishing them, rewriting them, putting yeah. them in a different order, sending them off. So uh, that's another activity. So it's the first time we've met David. Um, yes. oh, please in, yeah. introduce yourself to Librarycast your, about what you do and what inspires you in poetry and prose. Well, you might guess that my accent 
says that I'm from Scotland, but um, I've actually lived here uh, on the Mendips for 40 years now. And, uh, but I'm a new boy when it comes to the fountain poets. Um, although back in the day in London, when I first started writing poetry in the 70s, um, I kind of did the circuit, you know, the usual kind of troubadour poetry society, pubs and clubs thing. It was a very different world then. Well, I used to be the national chair of the British Association of Social Workers. And um, I, all my work's to do with child safeguarding. And so a lot of my inspiration for some poetry comes from people's behavior, let's put it that way. Um, however, I have written and I'm enjoying, and a little bit like Rachel was saying, you know, the inspiration of this lockdown has pulled me much back, back to nature again. Um, but at the same time, I have for six years until a year ago when I had a break, um, presented a regular podcast on uh, the social world. And um, I did about 80 or 90 programs interviewing everybody from the person next door to government ministers. So, I mean, effectively, that's my way of communicating in a lot. And I'm hoping to do much more of that now. And I think uh, I'll just put a new one out, a very personal one on my uncle who died at 99. Um, and his lovely recollections he left me that were amazingly called nice things that happened to me in the Second World War. The poem I want to read today is from where, where I live, which is up at Charterhouse, and the 2,000 years of my lead mining that have been there, and the inspiration from that, and how over the last 40 years I've begun to absorb and appreciate my environment here. Called the Charterhouse Mines. Blood-washed and slate, the sky presided over one hour's walk to mark the mines. The mist formed veils and fading light as shadows slid from shafts and a banshee of an owl claimed the night. Long-headed shepherds, moor and marsh dreamers, prehistoric miners of Iberian descent, all colonize the hills and form a charter house of painted caves and white skulls. And then the mist moves as a turning worm. Hard and straight, the lines of Rome converge with convicts for the mining and theatres for the troops. Smells of alchemy, arrogance and blood seep through villas whose owners rattle dice cups on mosaics where the wolf pack stood. The bleakest times of iron and mud-soaked wars let a merchant church command the shafts. Between the rage of foresters, the royal sword, and the silver greed of bishops, the land wept lead without a word. Near cheddar streams, as red as Waterloo soldiers, boys curled up and faded in seven years of life. In the swamp smell tunnels, through gruffy ground, Lamps in a thousand tents vanished in the wind and left the owl in the mist the only sound. All quiet now on the desolate hill, no noise, and silent graves washed away with the slurry, but their spirits pray in the heather bed, near the reeds where snipe prepare for sleep, and the grasslands as the rabbits lick the lead. Wells Fountain Poets, thank you so much for joining us. I was just wondering if any of your poetry has been published. And again, I throw that to the whole group as a free for all. Rachel has published several books. Well, yeah. so has Emma. <laughs> Emma even makes her own books, which is even more interesting. Um, yeah, I've, pub I've, I've published a couple of collections and a recent pamphlet and in magazines and journals. I think a lot of us, there have been a lot of call-outs for COVID poems and lockdown poems, which we've been doing. And rather like Emma said, going over old poems and seeing if there's a collection there somewhere. Um, but um, the other thing that I'm involved with is something called Poets for the Planet. I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion and Poets for the Planet is responding to that about the climate crisis. And we're, we're starting a new campaign, inviting people to 
right on the theme of begin afresh or no going back as Extinction Rebellion is putting it. So quite a political side to it too. Um, I, I haven't been published yet. Um, I haven't tried to be honest with you, but I am thinking about it because I've got quite a, a kind of body of work that I've got that I'd quite like to put out. Got the airwaves as well, haven't we? And I, I want to get people like Rachel and Emma to kind of join me and do podcasts. I'd love that because I, I want to get more steeped in this world. Yes, we'd love that too. I've been able to go to more poetry events than normal because I haven't had to pay for them and I haven't had to travel and I haven't had to book accommodation. So okay. there's a feast about on, on, on Zoom if you look for it, yep, David. Good. And we I, sometimes have a workshop, writing workshop. Have you ever collaborated in your poetry together to write, four of you getting together to write a single poem? Has that ever happened at the Fountain Poets? Several times, yes. We got together to write a piece called Water Woven, and I can't even remember how many participants there were, I think maybe seven. And I edited, edited it to the extent that one person didn't even recognize his work as being in there, which was rather unfortunate. <laughs> But uh, it, we performed it several times. We performed it at Bath Fringe Festival and uh, at Pretty Folk Festival, next door to a tent full of sea shanty singers. Uh, their singing was wonderful, but nobody could hear our work. I think we performed it three or four times. It went down really well. And we did another one about clothes. We did those, those other ones were more people putting their poems together. It wasn't the same kind of Not one seamless piece. No. We've, we've done things where we've, we've taken a theme and all performed poems and staged it according to that theme. I love working with other yeah. people. Yes, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I asked the Wells Fountain Poets what they enjoyed most about working and collaborating with each other. I love its inclusivity that, that um, you know, everybody has a right to belong. You know, not everybody's published, not everybody writes, you know, we all write in different ways. And, and yet there is that um, sense of community when we get together and, and really listen to each other. That's one of the things I love about Wells Fountain Poets. And it's just been a, a wonderful nursery for me, you know, sort of right at the beginning when I started writing a few years ago, that that helped me to hear what my poem sounded like out loud. Because I think when you read aloud to other people, that, you know, for some people it, it, it doesn't matter. It's much more what goes on internally and what's on the page. But for others, it's the importance of being able to communicate. And it's more mm. that if somebody hears it and says that poem made a difference to me, or I really love that, and that made you put into words what I was feeling, that means a lot. I love it because we don't take ourselves too seriously. We have a lot of laughter and sometimes tears as well. People feel safe to share poetry about things that are quite deep to them and people understand. We're very accepting. I think the way I would put it is that there's nothing as colourful as variety. Thank you so much, the Wells Fountain Poets Group. You've been listening to LibraryCast, your Somerset Libraries podcast, bringing to you libraries from home. <laughs>